Good to be here. So I'm a physics professor, and, and I really love nature, and I love the first-hand experience of the phenomena. And, and my goal, actually, in all this is to just get the students interested enough to go out and see the real thing. But what we're finding in museums is that our attendance is slowly going down as more people spend time on their computers. So my goal in all of this is to reach out through their computer and grab them and convince them that they should go out <laughs> and see the real thing. Okay? So, that's, so realize my heart is in the real phenomena of physics. And I will use the computer as a tool to motivate the students to get the real experience of science. So let me uh, start. I'm going to disappear. I'm not a star here. It's Second Life. And so this is about uh, science museums in the real. The one on the left there is the Exploratorium in San Francisco. We get 600,000 visitors a year at the Exploratorium. And the one on the right, that's the SPLO. That's the Second Life version of this museum. We'll learn a lot more about Second Life in a minute. We get 10,000 visitors a year. So we have a long way to go, but it's growing exponentially and very quickly. And the uh, Exploratorium also has a web page. And our web page, we have 15,000 pages of free science information for visitors. And it gets one million visitors a week. <laughs> so you can begin to see the impact you can have by bringing people in with, uh, with computers. And, uh, the little, and, and the Exploratorium actually had this web site, number 600, out of the entire web. We were the 600th web page, 1993, so we've been around for a long time adding material to the web. Our, our founder, Frank Oppenheimer, uh, spent some time here in Colorado at UC, up the road, and he did um, the... <laughs> We started physics labs one for you, Paul. that were so good that students would take their friends and sneak into the laboratories after hours to have their friends have the experience of, of physics. <laughs> and so he realized he was onto something. So he came to San Francisco, got San Francisco to rent him 100,000 square feet for a dollar a year in this white elephant of a building. And he put up a museum of physics experience. And one of the things he did is he stocked it with PhD scientists. And that makes it somewhat unique among the hands-on variety of museums. The natural history museums have a long tradition of having staff scientists, but the hands-on museums don't. So we have our PhDs, uh, more than a dozen PhDs there, and that really helps us get the science right. And this is me in Second Life. It turns out one of the things that's very difficult to do in Second Life is to make an older avatar. <laughs> you know, this, I have to tell you, this is the avatar with maximum wrinkles. It just gives you an idea. <laughs> looks so female. So, and in fact, what you do in this world of Second Life is you create an avatar, because you're in a three-dimensional world to explore. And those objects behind me are some of the ways we teach children about the value of pi. Each of the vertical rods is the circumference of the center circle. Hmm. And you can see various ways to think to help. With no words, it, it says C pi above, but these will work in any language. And they're the kind of thing I build in my museum there. The Exploratorium, with its 600,000 visitors, is one giant empty room full of 500 exhibits. We make one exhibit a week, and uh, we keep 500 of them, and they just keep changing all the time. Uh, the Splo Science Museum, we make two exhibits a week. <laughs> They're much easier to build in a virtual world. I've started a lot with uh, illusions. This is the staff of the museum that you're seeing there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the person in the Splo t-shirt was is Ron Hipschman. He's actually the one who put the Exploratorium on the web in 1993. He's my webmaster. Um, the, the woman in the long flowing gown is, uh, has a PhD in education. She does the educational evaluation of my programs. Um, the, uh, person who's typing behind the pole. He's the one that got us involved in Second Life in the first place. Um, let's see, the woman in the fluffy skirt is my postdoc in physics. So, uh, and there's also a graphic artist in red hair behind her. So it, take, it takes a team to make these museums, even in Second Life. We've just gone from our small museum uh, in Second Life. We now have a huge building. We have an entire island. When you buy a place in Second Life, what you do is you're buying a, a, a part of a server uh, Xeon quad server. And you get one quarter of it and it gives you 256 meters. It's in the metric system. <laughs> By 256 meters. 
And I'm going to start here in two ways. Uh, inside that museum, in fact, you can see I'm just beginning to fill it with exhibits, but at two a week, I'm going to fill it pretty soon. Um, so, New Media Consortium is an international non-for-profit organization of nearly 200 leading colleges, universities, museums, corporations, and other learning-focused bodies dedicated to pushing the edge of new media and new technology. For several years, the NMC has been at the forefront of using the two-dimensional web as a space for convening people around new ideas and knowledge sharing. The rich, interactive, three-dimensional NMC campus is located in the virtual world of Second Line. The campus extends the NMC experience into 3D virtual space, providing a space for insightful interaction, collaboration, learning, and experimentation, while encouraging the exploration of the potential of virtual environments. It is a place intended to inspire creative ideas and stimulate thoughtful discourse related to the potential of such spaces. It has been designed to be playful, yet serious at the same time. The campus itself encourages exploration and interaction, and most visitors will find something new on every visit. There are dozens of wonderful little niches and things to discover. Like the World Wide Web before, Second Life is a platform that allows users to share their ideas and creations with others around the world. But Second Life extends the internet into a three-dimensional world where visitors can interact in real time in a shared virtual space. 75% of users in a rapidly growing population have contributed content to a world that is 100% user-created. As a place of endless creativity, Second Life provides a richer creative social experience than is available on the 2D web. Unpredictable, emergent behaviors abound in a world where users are given free reign. And many Second Life residents have turned their play environment into their real-world careers. Lindex is a free market currency exchange that enables content creators whose varied skills range from graphic design to software development to sell digital goods for real money. Entrepreneurs in marketing, real estate, and professional services have created professional companies around the platform. A secondary market of contractors has emerged to support entrepreneurial efforts. The NMC campus exists in this virtual universe and is designed both to complement and extend it. The societal and economic aspects of Second Life inform the mission of the campus, which is to demonstrate how rich virtual worlds like Second Life can be put to productive use solving real-world issues. A variety of meeting spaces facilitate this work and allow the exploration of the human side of working in a 3D virtual environment. The library and museum are experimental spaces. The Malcolm Brown Library is the focal point of experiments exploring the intersection of 3D virtual space <laughs> and the web. The Art and Gallery and the Constable Room are places where the boundaries between art and representation and between art and derivatives are explored. Originally built to support a series of virtual conversations, the MacArthur Foundation series on digital media and learning. Given the tremendous response it has received, a wide range of activities are now planned for the NMC campus. From large-scale virtual components of real-life events, like the NMC Summer Conference, to events held entirely in Second Life, one possible future of the NMC campus is to be the home for a series of NMC meetings in virtual space. graduate and graduate classes interested in virtual environments, and much more such use is planned. What is most likely, however, just as the form of Second Life, is that the visitors to the NMC campus will find uses for it that we cannot possibly imagine today. To learn more about the NMC's journey into virtual space, and to follow along as the, to follow along as the project progresses, see the NMC campus observer set up to record not only our insights, but those of other Second Life residents as well.
gives you a little bit of a view of a recorded program about Second Life, and you saw some of the three-dimensional motion and the action of the avatars. But I wanted to tell you, I'm not there to make money. I'm, I'm a non -profit. I'm part of a nonprofit. My job is to excite students about science, because science can be life or death important. So let me tell you a, a story about how the Exploratorium got into Second Life. Um, the Exploratorium goes around the world to bring uh, videos of total solar eclipses to the world. Uh, it means that we get to travel many places, and the first place I went was we got on a raft and went down the Zambezi River, <laughs> where the Zambezi intersected the path of totality. And while going down the river, we stopped at every village along the way. And I, as a scientist, had two really important duties as I went down this river. One was to teach the villagers, you should not look with your naked eye at the partial solar eclipse. And two, you should look with your naked eye at the total solar eclipse. <laughs> and uh, those are two lessons which very often get confused in the history of total solar eclipses. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, it was wonderful. Uh, it turns out uh, Zambia was Rhodesia. And so almost all the people spoke English. So here I am, under the tree, in the village, teaching them to project, project partial solar eclipse images with their hands. Oh. And I took questions. And one of the older village women, who did not speak English, asked this question, uh, which was, and it just, people ask amazing things. She asked, how, you just told us that tomorrow at one o'clock in the afternoon, there, through an interpreter, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun. How long have people been able to predict that? <laughs> That's a great question. So I answered, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know. <laughs> but I do know that I can use Stonehenge to predict a total solar eclipse events. Not exactly here, but I can predict it. And I said that was built 4,000 years ago. And I listened to the translator. And the translator was going along in the native language. And he stuck in the word 4,000. And that's when I realized there was no word in the native language for the number 4,000. Huh. Yes. So I had to look around really quickly and I said, the number of years equal to the number of leaves on that tree. <laughs> and that's what you have to do sometimes when you're taking science around the world. You have to listen. And the people ask amazingly intelligent questions. I also got to go to the schools. I went to a school, and the school welcomed me with a dance. The school had composed a dance to welcome the physics professor. So I threw <laughs> out, it's wonderful, I threw out my entire program and I decided to teach total solar eclipses with a dance. So one of those girls is holding a model of the Earth and the other is holding a model of the moon at the correct scale distance. And I had them do the dance of the sun and the moon to illustrate the eclipses. So I believe in the reality of getting out there in the world and doing this. And in fact, the Exploratorium has some of the best cameras on Earth to take videos of total solar eclipses. So this year, well, 2006, we went to Turkey to a Roman amphitheater in the town of Sidae on the Mediterranean coast, and this is the amphitheater, and we sent out on the World Wide Web the video feed, and it went to 15 million people. We had 15 million hits during the total solar eclipse. That was the record. We beat the Mars landers for numbers of people who viewed us. <laughs> 7 million on NASA and 8 million on MSNBC, and I was the announcer standing on the stage down the bottom there. But what we did for the first time ever was we went into Second Life. This is Amy Weber, and she built a complete replica of the Roman amphitheater in a few days behind me there. <laughs> and we streamed the video into the amphitheater live, and you can see the avatars there, and we, we had about 100, <coughs> only 100 instead of 15 million, but it was a start. But here's the thing, all 100 avatars stayed for the total solar eclipse for the full hour. We actually had three, si three sites, and this is only one of the three sites. Um, they stayed for the full hour, and we, we interviewed them later, we did some research. We found out, and here is the difference between the web and second life type of uh, interaction. Um, um, one of those avatars was from Finland. The person sitting next to him was from Japan. They're eclipse fanatics. They turn to each other and say, look at that prominence at one o'clock or the lower, you know, lower upper, upper right of the sun and start to discuss prominences. That interaction between people, which you get with your students in a university. Why do students come to universities? Why don't they learn from books? Why do they need professors? The social aspects of talking to each other, of studying together, of asking questions and helping each other, that's one of the essences of a university experience. And you can get at that, and the two-dimensional web, the
flat web, you don't get that back and forth instantaneous flow, that, that human interaction that makes learning so much fun. And that's what turned me on to second life, was seeing this Eclipse event. So along the way, here's the classic textbook illustration of the sun, with Amy Weber hugging it, and uh, <laughs> what makes an eclipse. It turns out in Second Life, everybody kind of hugs, and they fly, and they sit on things, as you'll see. <laughs> so I built the scale model of the Earth and Moon system, and uh, the Earth is in the distance, it's one meter in diameter, the Moon is in the foreground, it's a quarter meter diameter, there's 30 meters between them. If you look at a the textbook in astronomy, you're never going to see that to scale. Mm -hmm. But actually being in Second Life where you actually start at the Earth and you walk 30 meters at full scale to the Moon, you realize, why would we ever have a total solar eclipse? There's no chance the Moon's ever going to line up. Mm -hmm. And that's why they only happen on slightly less than twice a year. But this is my version. I took the Sun, I took the Moon, I took the Earth, I filled the vacuum of space, which is that blue tube with smoke. And then you can see why there is an umbra and a penumbra. And of course, in Second Life, you can send your friends to stick their head in the umbra. <laughs> when they do that, they find out it's an umbra because you can't see the sun when your head is in it. And you can't do that in a textbook, and you can't do that in a two-dimensional web. There are certain things in 3D that this is really good to do. And then I did the following thing. The path of an eclipse across the Earth is a, sometimes a sigmoid curve. So I made this animation. There's the moon there and the earth, and the moon, the shadow on the surface of the earth, is moving uh, a thousand miles an hour across the surface of the earth. And the surface of the earth itself is, sorry, it's moving 2,000 miles an hour across the surface of the earth. The surface of the earth is moving a thousand miles an hour at the equator. And when you combine those two motions, and I did, I had the Earth, I, I oriented the Earth's axis to the correct orientation for this eclipse. I put the moon in its orbit in the correct position, and I just turned on physics and let it run. And so people can see the movie of how the path on the surface depends on a rotation and a revolution. Um, we also do other things. This is a three-dimensional animation of the path of Halley's Comet. The yellow thing in the bottom center there is the sun, and the dots are Halley's Comet, and you can see Kepler's laws. And in Second Life, what people do is they sit on Halley's Comet and they take that ride. And you go out and you spend most of the 80 years hanging around out there in space and then you wee in towards the sun. You just whip around it in a, a short arc and then go back out again. It's actually fun to do physics in Second Life. And, and so now what I'm going to do is we're going to pause for a minute and I'm going to uh, turn over the connection to Jeff Corbett here. And Jeff is going to take you to the University of Denver in Second Life. <laughs> what? Can we pause for more wine at this point? How much is the tuition in Lincoln dollars? Yes, okay, so, not while, while, while he said, oh, there, it's on already. Wow. Okay, so, here we are, the future home of the science school, and uh, what, the woman on the left there is Amy Weber, and she actually is a, a full-time, makes her living full-time in Second Life, building things and scripting them. There's a scripting language. I can do physics in Second Life by solving partial differential equations and applying those and showing you the result in Second Life. Actually, probably as in any educational institution, the ones who learn the most are the instructors. And so the students that I hire to write the programs to simulate physics and mathematics in Second Life probably learn more physics and mathematics than the people who come and play with my exhibits. But that's okay. I'm a professor. I like that. So, Paul, does that mean that, that she is sitting somewhere like in San Francisco now? On so, Amy now? is in New York, and Jet Burns is at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They just brought an island. So, JPL has an island, a 256 by 256 square meter island. And he is filling it with physics and uh, science experiences to promote JPL. So those two real people, though, are actually sitting in front of computers at this moment. Is and they, they're they're alive. That is a lot. Yeah, okay. That is a And the yes. foreground, Zazen Man Manby is sitting right here in front of me. <laughs> so we have California on the right, uh, New York, and here in Denver. All <laughs> together, and they can hold conversations. Um, yes. They're concentrating on a game. <laughs> no, that was right through your head. So there's the symbol of the University of Denver. Founded 18th Founders Day. What a day to come. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to show you that. So fly over and show them Woolen Hall. There's 
So you can fly in this world. It's kind of fun to fly. <laughs> and here we go. There's all in Hull. <laughs> we're using this in the exploratory. We're about to move into a double a building that's double our size. We're building a one-to-one -one model of our new space in Second Life to work out the architectural kinks before we build it in steel and, <laughs> and cement. That's cute. Which is a really great use. A lot of architecture departments teach architecture courses in Second Life. And they teach their students the physics of arches, because if you build an arch wrong in Second Life and turn on physics, it will collapse. <laughs> it's much cheaper. So here we are taking a nice view around. And here's how it looks at night. Oh yeah, so uh, we'll go to <laughs> It's great to have control. You can actually grab the sun with your hand and move it around in the sky. It's kind of nice. <laughs> Especially if you're an architect, to see the effect of lighting from different angles during the day. Is the coffee cart always open in there? Yeah, <laughs> the coffee cart's always open. Um, there actually, uh, lots of biology departments have done experiments in Second Life. They've made ecologies where they had plants and pollinators and animals that ate the pollinators and trees, and they programmed these and turned them loose and then watch as the ecology fell apart and have to have uh, intelligent humans come back to try to fix it. But then with time, they can adjust the parameters of the interacting biosystems. And they, they can actually do models of biology and have the students come and see where the models work and where they don't, just like physics works and doesn't work. <laughs> so, can we want to go back to the daytime? Or is this really good at night? This is good at night. <laughs> Well, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, it's an astronomical observatory. Of course it's better at night. <laughs> so, here you have in Second Life. Uh, this is up on Mount Evans. And uh, we're flying in, and there's, there's the telescope. <coughs> and you look through the, can you look through the eyepiece? So you go to Second Life, and you look through the eyepiece. <laughs> oh, there's something in there. There it is. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you'd get that image in that belt. That is the kind of thing you want to do. So, I do informal education in Second Life. And, and part of it is you do not just hit up people over the head with the information, you reward them for looking. So, there's no sign there saying, look through this eyepiece. There's an eyepiece. And what do you do when there's an eyepiece? You look through it. Well, and if you do, you're rewarded by these great images. Okay, so now we'll fly in. This is the building. It's, it's a model of the Rose Center in uh, New York City from the, the planetarium. And um, it was built for the eclipse. And as you uh, walk in here, you can see the exhibits that I showed you. Uh, we'll walk into this place. Look at them. The shadows and the lighting. There you go, back. the red line there is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The moon's orbital tilt there shows the blue line, which is the orbit of the moon, and the yellow plane is the um, plane of the ecliptic. In my museum, there's always a sign next to the exhibit. If you click on the sign, it gives you an information card. Okay? And the information card is for <coughs> just gentle visitors. But at the bottom of that information card, if you click again, you get a second information card, which has the mathematics and the physics, the equations. And in a real museum, you cannot put an equation on uh, an exhibit graph, or people will run screaming out of the building. <laughs> Except the physics professors. And they go, ooh, oh, look at that. Yeah, so. But in Second Life, uh, there, and there's the uh, smoke-filled uh, room there. Uh, but in Second Life, People can click on one, I can give them the information, they can click again, get the equations, click again, and go out to a worldwide website and go as deep as you want. So something that real museums have wanted to do all the time, which is to provide depth of information, and which I just saw, Eddie Goldstein here is from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and yesterday I saw their Space Odyssey, and they had science experts sitting next to the experiences where these science experts, the, the third grader could come up and ask them questions and then answer at the level of the third grader, and the physics professor could come up and ask them questions, and they are actually scientists, and they could answer those questions too. So aside from having a person there, having an exhibit graphic that allows you to go into depth is really important. So this is the actual, oh, she walked right through the sun. So this is the model. <laughs> Back up a little bit, hit number two. This is step one, and if you do step two, the Earth rotated a bit and the moon moved. And now step three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight. And that shows you why the path of totality is the path of totality. One step at a time. I decided to do it with a step through instead of a movie. So I, I made, I forced the interaction and the thoughtfulness of the people. Scale is a real problem. It turns out, if I wanted to make a real model of a total solar eclipse mm. with the sun and the earth and the moon at some sort of reasonable scale, I could not fit it into one 256-meter sim. <laughs> just the scale of the sun and the moon and the earth is just so vast, you cannot even do it in second life. Um, never mind a, a textbook. Um, so let's, let's fly over here. To, now, one of the things that's really great about the University of Denver in its historical past is its interest, and still to this day, in the molecules of the atmosphere. And in particular, the most important part of the molecules in the atmosphere, which is global warming. So here we come, and we're looking here. So you see carbon dioxide, and you see the infrared spectrum. You can give real science graphics here. But then, swinging around to the right, okay. if you click on the, red, on the yellow ball here, it'll give you a choice of exciting the oscillation of that carbon dioxide molecule in the background. So we excite it by clicking. 4.28. Yeah, 4.28. And you can see the mode of oscillation of the carbon dioxide, and it emits an infrared photon, shown in red, and then it stops oscillating. Let's go to the uh, longer one. Let's go to 10. Well, here's a different frequency of uh, wavelength, frequency of oscillation, and we get, hopefully, did it, did it oscillate? No. Okay, let's go up and try the 14. There we go. <laughs> Different mode of oscillation. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Yeah. So, this shows you the kind of uh, chemistry and physics you can program into second life. Where you can have molecular models are hard, but you can do molecular models. Molecular models that move. For example, we try to build a model of the protein villain, which is in your system, uh, which folds to change its activity. And when we put that on the floor of the Exploratorium, even though we use titanium rods and heliart welding, the seventh graders managed to destroy it in a day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're building it now out of pencils in Second Life, so that they can you can watch the folding of the protein without tr having the problems of destroying it. <laughs> of second Life. Okay, so um, why do you want to see pretty first? Sure. Oh, look at that. <laughs> you burst into flames. <laughs> that was good. Isn't that biblical? Okay. <laughs> uh, in fact, there are quite a few Bible studies in Second Life. <laughs> it's, it's used a lot in language programs. That uh, many of the people come from other countries, and they would they love to meet native English speakers, to, because in Second Life right now you, you communicate by typing. It's slow. You can parse the sentences. You write short, succinct sentences. It's a good way to learn. In June, they're going to bring voice to Second Life, they promise. And so that they'll still keep the typing, but it's a wonderful way for students to acquire a competence in a language. I thought so, I'd go over and do this tsunami real quick. Okay, sure. So this is the International Space Flight Museum. The Exploratorium actually was the first real-life museum to have a space in Second Life. But the International Space Flight Museum, those are one-to-one -one models of uh, almost every rocket that has ever gone into space by all the countries of the world. They have about 80 employees who just are fanatics at building the exact scale models, which you can fly around and visit. And they have a wonderful auditorium there. And here's how you teach a class in Second Life. I taught a class there uh, live during the transit of Mercury about transits. And I stood on the stage. And behind me, we had those two television. Maybe you can play in the movie right now live, NASA TV. Yeah. I stood on the stage. I had an audience of 40 in front of me. I showed the live movie of the transit that the Exploratorium was streaming from the National Optical Astronomy Observatory on Kitt Peak, Arizona. Hmm. Um, so we had the live video behind me. I had a model of Mercury in front of me. I made a three-dimensional model of Mercury's orbit above me. People could fly up, fly around the three-dimensional model, see why transits are rare, because the tip of Mercury's orbit, and we have to be on the crossing of Mercury going through the plane of the ecliptic, and the Earth in the right position to see a transit. Nothing's plain. Okay. I, had, I had people in the audience who were seniors in high school. I had people in the audience who were NASA engineers. I had physicists. 
I had questions from astronomers, and this is what I do at the museum. I answer third grade questions, I answer physics professor questions. So it, was, it was a wonderful interactive experience live there on the stage. And, and the people in the audience could inter instant message each other. This, today and yesterday, I taught classes of students in this room, and those students all had their computers up there. And you know, I bet they were instant messaging each other <laughs> about my lecture and about dating later on. <laughs> <laughs> that can happen in this audience as well. They sit around. If, if they have a question for the demonstrator, and they're too shy to ask it, they can ask their friend. And if they get enough of them together, someone gets up the courage to finally ask the question. So this provides a model of a formal education as it's going on in here, but in a place where I can snap my fingers and have a three-dimensional model of Mercury's orbit to drop down in the classroom and run it. And then all the students can rise up in the air and fly around and look at it. Uh, now this one here is uh, Noah and Eric Hackenthorn over here. So raise your hand, Eric, so they know who to get you later. <laughs> okay, that's Eric. Um, he has a sim from Noah, and this is teaching you about tsunamis. And so if you look at this wonderful, nice beach here, <laughs> and uh, Zazen is going to walk into the waves. And uh, as we walk out here, <laughs> oh, look at that. It's a fault zone. Oh, my word. Perhaps we shouldn't be living here. And here we have, uh, actually, there's a heads-up display you get as you come into this land. And if you wear the heads-up display, it narrates to you in my voice, because <laughs> I'm the narrator, about the science behind tsunamis while you're looking at these things, but there's also things to read. And we come on the land here, so you go explore, and we'll land, and if you could start the tsunami, please. Okay. <laughs> start the tsunami. So, there we go. Please wait. Do you have a HUD, John? He does not have a HUD. All right. Does it work without the HUD? Uh, well, it, it's a little quiet. <laughs> I will provide the narration. <laughs> yes, <laughs> since I did. Um, all right, a tsunami is a series of powerful waves. Yes, there you go. You can provide the narration. <laughs> well, while we're waiting, are there questions so far? I'll take questions at the end. But things you've been doing. So this, this is a program you download. There's an earthquake yes. right now. So it's free. First of all, Second Life is free. You just go to www.secondlife.com. Oh, there's an earthquake happening now under the sea. I see. And I hear the sirens. Anyway, just keep going. Distance. <laughs> there it goes. Oh, good. Now look at this. Isn't that interesting? Shouldn't we run out and look at the dead flapping fish? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe pick up something from the uh, an anchor or something. Oh, look, a marlin. Okay, look at a marlin. You know what that's worth on the open market? Um, oh, uh oh. Okay. Yeah, so that's the model. Oh, so, no. Yep. You can see the graphics are still. So this. this is uh, Second Life 1.0. By the time they get to 3.0, it will be better. <laughs> so here we come. Uh oh, that's not good. <laughs> Luckily, you, were, you had those heavy shoes on. I know. But the buildings are gone. <laughs> and the the narration goes on to tell you when the sea recedes, get out of there. And it also says that tsunami is plural for a reason, and that it's not just one wave. In California, in Crescent City, the people that died. They, had got, they heard the tsunami warnings, they left, the tsunami came, they went back, and then the second wave came an hour later. An hour? So, I think about second wave, uh, we can restore it. You can restore everything. Oh, <laughs> and, and notice there's a survey box there. So we can do education surveys and get information about, well, what did people learn? And so a lot of educators are really excited about Second Life and about the ability to survey people and, and to ask them questions. Okay. So can you talk to that person right now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you can say ignore. Say ignore. She could tell from her physicist. She could tell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, in Second Life, there are lots of people that are really interested in learning. And so when they find out I'm a physicist, they talk to me. It's great. I really like that. You're um, so. What? messing with my survey data. Sorry. Yeah, I, I actually canceled my answers to your survey today. <laughs> okay, well, All right. one thing. <laughs> okay, so that's that's a little uh, real-life experience, and so I'm going to take the cable back. <laughs> okay.
But you really get the idea of the kinds of things that can happen here. So, uh, so, so questions? Yes. Uh, now, of course, you do this in a real museum or not, uh, or this, but uh, what restricts you to doing real things versus totally bogus explanations of totally bogus? And of course, you could do a totally bogus explanation of Eclipse live with Exploratorium. So, but for some reason, it seems like it might be easier to pull off because there isn't any need to be attached to reality. Right. So what is the authenticity? Exactly. And, and of course, you know you should ask that question of every website you ever go to. So I teach high school physics teachers. And one of the most important lessons I teach them is that when you go out on the web, answer a question. You look at the provenance of who is answering your question. And the same thing is really important in Second Life. And so when you go into the museum, we actually tell you who is behind this, uh, this museum, that the Exploratorium is behind the museum. And the Exploratorium and its reputation for getting science right is standing up for, for this museum. But you absolutely must ask that question, and as you would on anything on the World Wide Web. Um, you know, just as a scientist, don't trust anyone. You know, don't, you know, nullis, nullius in verbia, verba, you know, don't take anyone's word for it. Um, go, go check it out yourself. So, um, you know, a lot of science museums have your weight on other worlds. Well, in Second Life, we have your weight on Earth. <laughs> Earth is the other world here. And so, uh, and so we actually, uh, to do this, we actually integrate the volume of the avatar and then use the density of water and figure out your weight on Earth. <laughs> so it's the first time in Second Life you could do that. And actually, this is part of your weight on other worlds. And we realized we couldn't do the, your weight on other worlds in Second Life because nobody knew what their avatar weighed. Uh, this, this woman who's here uh, doing this uh, is uh, six foot six inches tall, and she weighs about 160 pounds. Uh, but um, it's uh, uh, but she wouldn't know that. There's no way she'd know that until we integrate her volume. Uh, <laughs> complex intervals. Um, and here is another learning experience in Second Life. This is a cube, and the blue bar off the left shoulder of this woman here is a 10 light year long cube. These are the 20 stars nearest to the Earth. And the thing about Second Life is I can walk into the cube, or she can walk into the cube, and uh, have the stars be around me. And all of those stars are the exact correct color. We use the astronomical recordings of the spectra. I looked up, the, there's a site that gives you the RGB values on a computer screen to make them the correct color. They each, when you get close to them, has the name of the star on it. When you click on the star, it tells you all about the star. And uh, that's, that's a wonderful way to learn about stars. Here's actually the... Um, transit of Mercury. I'm on the stage doing the transit of Mercury live. This is at the end of the transit. Um, here is the orbit of Mercury we're looking at. Um, the, the person in the green coat is actually Abulius. He is a physics graduate student at UC Santa Barbara. And I hire him to do my programming. And I taught um, how to solve physics problems using digital um, finite difference analysis for 10 years in university. So instead of me programming this, I hire him to program this. I teach him how to do it. He gets the skill of programming in Second Life. I can use him in Second Life, and he learns the physics behind it. So that's been a wonderful association for both of us. Now, the next one is actually another movie by... Welcome to NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratories Experiment
Users <laughs> enjoy the ride. They learn about various instruments Noah uses to gather data from the Earth's troposphere and stratosphere. Next, we board a virtual P3 Orion Hurricane Hunter. These airplanes are based out of Florida, and the brave men and women from Noah Corps fly through storms to assist in their research. During this virtual recreation, visitors learn about the Bible research Noah provides through <coughs> hurricane prediction, completes with the experience of flying through a virtual hurricane before returning visitors safely to the ground. Our next stop is a small strip of the island's coast. Here, visitors learn about how tsunamis form under sea earthquakes and the role Noah plays in protecting lives from these dangerous waves. A virtual buoy with the DART system explains how tsunamis are detected, giving visitors a chance to escape to higher ground or a wave of crashes into the shore. The area is designed to promote awareness of tsunamis and their dangerous destructive power. Next, we dive into Noah Ezreal's Aquarium. Visitors here choose if they would like to get their feet wet or ride in the Saliba, a virtual research vessel. The island's aquarium has a variety of displays, including a hydrothermic vent demonstrating a unique form of sea life in a hidden underwater cave. When you are finished, stop by the Crawford Building and pick out sea creatures for your own virtual land. Visitors can click on the exhibits they find during their exploration and browse through supporting web pages containing additional information. Various undersea plant and animal life has been recreated over the entire eastern half of the island. Several ecosystems are represented, with a southern area containing equatorial sea life and then slowly transitioning to a northern polar region. Finally, coming up from the depths, we visit a glacier. This glacier can be viewed at various stages of its demise, and the effects on sea level are easily seen once a visitor gets their feet wet. The area is designed to promote discussion regarding the issue of climate change and has links to the research Noah currently has underway. Thankfully, this glacier will reset once it melts, and visitors need not worry about losing their chance to see it before it disappears forever. Thank you for joining me on this survey of Noah Ezra's virtual island. I hope you'll consider visiting and join the ongoing discussions surrounding the Earth's environment. Check out our demonstration website at http www.ezra.noah.gov slash outreach slash SL for the latest information regarding these virtual exhibits and upcoming lectures. Yeah, Eric. <laughs> Whose voice was that? Uh, I don't know. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I bet that was me. I thought that was me. <laughs> so this is the, the actually uh, the, <coughs> where we're bringing together the the science rela teaching related sites in Second Life into one region called Scilands. And Spaceport Alpha is the International Space Flight Museum. <coughs> they, they were so successful they got a second one. The Exploratorium is over here. These are two Exploratoriums. Um, this is NOAA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You have a reservation if you want Denver Biology or Science School here at Denver. National Physical Laboratory in England. National Physical Laboratory again. Nanotechnology Space. NASA CoLab. Elon University. So this is an amazing place. The most visited place in, in Second Life is Spaceport Alpha. So uh, that's the most visited education place. Don't they always? So, so if we were going to try to get students involved in this, is there a way that we can prevent them from getting exposed to some of the things that might get? Thank goodness, there's none of that sex and gambling in the university. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want them to just be able to point to me and say yeah. that. So in fact, this. this space, uh, you can't stop it, but this space is PG. Okay. And in Second Life, what that means is no nudity, no soliciting sex. This, this is supposed to be for the science and the education. It's a PG realm. If you're in there and you're misbehaving, you will be ejected from here forever. <laughs> Your name will get you, you as a landowner, if someone misbehaves on your land, they're out of there. And it, you're the full decider. There's no, there's no appeal. If they misbehave, they're gone. And that is your control. And so and it works pretty well. I've been there a lot and I've never people have never I never I've been in my museum a lot. And I've never caught people misbehaving sexually in my museum. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Just I'm there a lot and I've never seen it. But it's something to worry about. Well we can change that. The what? We could change that. <laughs> change that. I know. Now you know what my museum is. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Simple. Yeah. Uh, if if we wanted to check this out for ourselves, yes. what are the steps? Because I, I remember going to the website and it seemed like 
it was a major commitment of creating an avatar, yeah. etc. So, so what is the minimal if you just wanted to scope it out? So to scope it out, but you just add the scoping out. But if you, if you to visit it right now, it's still uh, it's still in development and it's not perfect yet. It's got a long way to go. But what you do is you go to Google, look for Second Life. Go to Second Life. You have to download a client program to your machine. When the client program is in there, you can go to Second Life. They'll they'll greet you, and you can create your own body. Pick one off the shelf, and then you actually have to learn to use the commands to move the arrow keys on your computer to move around and and to move the camera around as you go. It, it, it takes a little while to learn. They actually make you go through about a 20-minute class in learning how to move and use the camera. And then uh, once once you're inland, um, you can write write to me, Tola McElroy. And I will send you a, a list of education landmarks where you should visit to try out. So you don't. There are, there are. They have a server farm right now that has 6,500 Xeon Quad servers to run this. And there are four, there are four 200, 256 by 256 meter uh, lands on each one of those servers. So there's like 20,000. So you, there, there's so much to experience here. You'll get lost without a guide. So. Uh, Look me up, write, write to me, and I'll, I can send you the information. But there is a 20-minute commitment to getting in and getting your app without learning to move. Okay. Uh, by the way, so what I did was I made, these, of course, are the atomic orbitals, the S, E, D, F. And, and what do people do in the museum? They go sit on them. Okay. But if you click on them, you actually get the description of how they are spherical Legendre polynomials. I'm really proud of that. But people do sit on them. Another thing about Second Life, this is a poster I did about Second Life and about the museum. And um, poster sessions. I have been to more poster sessions in Second Life in science this year than I've been to real posters sessions. The, the people actually put up the poster. There it is, the same poster you have at the science session. People from all over the world fly in. You're standing next to your poster. They look at your poster. They ask you questions. IBM just spent $100 million in Second Life. They're having all of their, not all of them, but a lot of their international gathering of their employees in Second Life, in virtual spaces. You bring people from all over the world, they come together in an auditorium, you do your presentation, they talk to each other, they talk to you, they ask questions, they interact in Second Life. So that is a bit of a commitment in time and, and, and money. They really believe in it. And there are many other organizations that are using Second Life to promote themselves. Don't underestimate the value of advertising in Second Life to this audience. Uh, there, it now has, yesterday, that at 4,300,000 people had tried Second Life. In the last two months, 1,600,000 of them had returned. Yesterday, there were 38,000 of them online at once. I didn't see how many were on today, but as we were on there. And those 38,000 people all around the Second Life. And so, um, and these are people that have good computers, so if you are interested in people who want us to have money to spend, uh, they're in Second Life. Or if you're, if there are lots of people, I'm in Second Life and I'm in a museum, and people come to me in that museum and they say, I really like this experience. There should be more science in Second Life. I, I, I want to learn things in Second Life. So that is really heartwarming for me to hear from them. Um, but I, I want to end with, with one sort of final word here, and I'll take questions. And the final world word is, that's a real apple. You can't beat the real apple. The smell, the feel, the weight. The real apple is something truly amazing. My whole goal is to get people to the real apple. And yet, we make models of apples in the classroom. <laughs> we pass around a little wooden apple. It's about the same weight. You know, that's, that's, that's wood, that's not an apple. But maybe we can learn something about apples from that wooden apple. And then up here on the screen, I've got a picture of an apple. And there's the textbook, you know. That, we're, we're getting a little bit farther removed from the smell and the chemistry. But you know, in, in that, that picture, it's still, you can use it to identify what an apple is. And, uh, oops, sorry, not found. Um, but then there's the word apple, okay? So we've really come a long way. So that's books, that's Gutenberg with the words. But you can read about apples. You can read about the chemical reactions and why they brown. The words can fill in a lot about the apples. So we use the words to describe out the symmetries. We use the models to really understand what, it, what does it take to make somebody be able to identify that as an apple. Now, I haven't seen that, identify this as an apple. And so now, what, what I'll do is I'll offer you the apple in second life. 
and ask, where does it fit between the word apple and the real apple? Where does it belong in the spectrum of learning about Second Life? And so in the spirit of Richard Feynman, take the apple, experience the apple, and just let the words and the pictures and the models and the Second Life lead you to it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I'll take questions. <laughs>
And there are some things, there are some amazing new experiments using the two-slit experiment that are just, uh, they blow my mind my bike. In, in terms of the late choice. So keep running that in the background and we'll keep questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, you you what mentioned that you, you could use this, or you did use this for posters. Yes. Now, virtually everything you've shown us has been very limited in its resolution, very artificial. Yes. If you're two-dimensional, can you actually show something with really good resolution so that a rose looks like a rose? Yes. So, in fact, you can get good resolution. It just takes time to download it. So I, I chose to run this at high speed rather than high resolution. So you can actually, if you're willing to take the time, you can do uh, more than 2,000 by 2,000 resolution. Mm -hmm. if, if your screen can handle it, you can do that with wonderful presentations in Second Life. But I, it, the, the standard choice in Second Life, because people do not have the latest highest speed computers, is to keep the resolution down to 500 by 500. So that's what you're seeing. It's, everybody knows that if you want everyone to see your image, keep it to 500 mm -hmm. by 500. But if you really need the resolution, you can do it. You can go to 1024 by 1024, 2048, 50, you know, 5000. Yeah, more. okay. Oh, great. So, but, it, but it will take time to load. Mm -hmm. Time versus resolution is the classic trade off. Yeah. So there is some physical spacing of one island next to one island. And you, to get from one to the other, you have to go through some rigid system. No. It turns out there's teleportation in this world. So all I have to go do is go somewhere is to type the name of the place I want to go and hit teleport and I'm there over the entire world. In fact, the world is everything here is built by a bit by the uh, people who live here, and it now has now reached the point that if you start at one side of Second Life, flying at full speed across Second Life, you can never see everything in Second Life because by the time you finish your trip a majority of what you saw on the way over will have changed. That's how fast it's changing. There's no way to experience all of Second Life, even now. And it's, it's that ability for people to create that makes it interesting for me. I love to build experiments. I love to teach people. Yeah. Uh, you, you talked about, I think you used a difference analysis to, uh, to make yeah. things move, right. um, using the scripting language. Yes. Um, but how realistic is the actual physics engine? If I Awful! Oh, the, the actual <laughs> physics engine they're using in Second Life right now is the Havoc 1 physics engine from 2001. Yeah. And that's the space ops. But it's, uh, it's, it's just terrible. In fact, that's what's driven me to write my own difference engine equations. In, but the scripting language is fine. Mm -hmm. So I can write the program in the scripting language to make the motion correct. Uh -huh. And that's what I've had to do. Now, they promise that they're going to upgrade the physics engine within the year. Right. And maybe then, it's actually very easy to build things. In the exhibits, I, I built the shape of the exhibit very quickly. You can texture them. I can take a picture of this audience and put it on the wall in just, just a, a, a minute um, in, in Second Life. Now, in fact, here's the, here's the laboratory that, right there in Olin Hall. And that table in the middle, right, right to the right of Zazen, is the place where the two-slit experiment was when I first met Amy. And I made her take it off because it wasn't good enough. And I'm building with her the one to replace it that will be the correct. But the, the, the Linden scripting language is actually pretty good. And the, uh, the tools to build things are really fast. And I really like them. And to texture them. And so I can build in this world much faster than I can build an exhibit in the Exploratorium. So we use it as a prototyping area. Several of the exhibits that I've built in this world now exist in physical reality in the Exploratorium. Because I showed them to our design staff and they said, we like that. It's never been done in any museum before. We're going to make it real. So I'm using this as a prototyping area. 3D. One other oh, there he is. He's building an uh, airfoil shape, uh, ellipsoid. So yeah. One other question is, how much does this cost you uh, to to produce? Right. So um, it's free for you to experience it. For me, um, I, I I had an island. I bought an island. And for a nonprofit to buy an island, it's nine hundred and eighty dollars, and that buys you one quarter of a server installation. And then it's $150 a month rent on that. And uh, I built, uh, I was given free space to build a prototype of my museum. And uh, a person came in, loved the science that I was teaching in my museum so much, she gave me the $1,000 of the island and a year's worth of rent and said, make this bigger, I love it. And uh, so we've had to, and, and, and this was a person who was a donor to the Exploratorium, who loved the Exploratorium, uh, could not, because uh, physical conditions could never come back to the exploratorium again. Mm -hmm. She could come to this virtual world 
the, the, the um, population in this virtual world who are in wheelchairs, who are bedridden, and who use this as their only outreach to, to, to other people. In this world, they can fly, they can dance. Some of them choose to still be in wheelchairs because they consider the wheelchair part of them. And yet, they can reach out from, from their entrapment at home and socialize with other people around the world. That's amazing. And that's one of the things I dearly love about this, this world. And, uh, and you can't tell them. They're, they're out there in this world. So, um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> get carried away there. But anyway, so, so I'll support. Um, so there's one person who is, cannot get out of her house, um, essentially saw this place, fell in love with it, and is supporting us entirely in all of our costs. Is the uh, Space Flight Museum offering suborbital rides for profit yet? <laughs> no, yes. It's free, however. But you can go to the International Space Flight Museum. Oh, wow, look at that shape. That's no, beautiful. But Paul is a fundraising <laughs> device. Oh, they could. So actually, when you go to the Space Flight Museum, they have a planetarium like you would not believe. You step into <coughs> Titan, Titan II rocket. Yes. And you ride up to the International uh, Space Station. You go from the International Space Station, you can look around and there are the planets. You teleport to the planets. So you go out and there's Mars. And then when you get to Mars, you teleport to the surface and there's the Viking lander. And around you is the virtual reality view downloaded from the MER. So you see Mars surface in 3D as it would appear. You can also go to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Space Odyssey. They have a room which models, the, which was based on uh, space photographs of the surface of Mars. And they have uh, people behaving as science researchers in, in this space. It's like you might have been to an aquarium where the people are swimming around with the fishies. You know, that they don't have cement overshoes. But in, in Denver, they have their uh, experts there um, in modeling what science might be like on Mars. And uh, it's, it's really quite, a, I like that a lot. So if there's any Denver to ask. But you, this planetarium, you visit the planets. <coughs> You go and see them, the, all their wounds are to the correct scale. You go to the surface of Mars. They haven't put the surface of the other planets in yet, but that would be great. Yes? My question is, I, I'm taking um, 16 third graders to Mars next week. Yes! And I would like to take them to Mars. Yeah. How do I, the question earlier, how do I keep the content? So you can't, so you don't take the third graders, alas. What if I take the third graders the way he's taking us? You, you could. You could and be, uh, be quick on the... It, mostly it's going to be fine. You notice we were not interrupted in this, in this uh, thing. But in particular, the International Space Flight Museum, once you get to Mars, once you get up off the surface, you will not be interrupted by inter inappropriate behavior. Okay? And on the surface, you won't be much either. These are, these are places... This is a PG area. It's, it's known that, that you don't get disrupted. It can always happen. I cannot guarantee anything. So you have to be quick on the switch. This would be a lot more useful educationally if we could get the army to Yes. Oh, I agree. And in fact, right, what they're doing now is there is a second thing. There's a second second life called the teen grid. But you have to be, what's the minimum age? 13? Teen grid, yes, 13. So, so they have a second grid, which is only, adults are not allowed in this at all, ever. It's only 13 to 17 year olds. Adults can go to certain specified islands, but they can never go to the mainland. So it's the, all the content is made by teens, for teens, and it's 13 to 17-year-olds. And at 17, you're kicked out. You have to go to the adult grid. And there's nothing here for the younger ages. And, and those of us that work in the museum environment know that the museum audience is getting younger and younger and younger. The parents are bringing in younger and younger and younger children. And I think that SL has to evolve in a way. There are, there are other programs similar to this for young children, but nothing as creative as this one. So I see my watch. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think I mean, if anybody has any additional questions, Come down ask. we can <laughs> deal with it down here. I think as a university, our challenge is to take something that has proven its worth in the informal educational environment. Our challenge will be to find a way to deal with the satisfactory appropriately for the formal educational experience. Let's thank our speaker. Oh.